I love YouTube. I really do. So when I was younger, when I was riding around on my woolly mammoth, I took a soapstone carving class from a Native American man, very nice man. And he taught us how to create creatures from soapstone. What he did was he took us into a room, it was like eight or nine classmates of mine, about my age at the time, and we were in a room with a bunch of pieces of soapstone. And he said, I want you to pick out a piece of soapstone that speaks to you, that says, I want to become something, whatever that something was. In my case, it was a seal. I saw a piece of soapstone and said, that's a seal. It looks like a seal. It just needs me to shape it a little bit. So sure enough, that's what I did. Took that piece of soapstone and I shaped it into a seal. So my mom thought this was great. I was carving. So that Christmas, I got a box, a soapstone carving box, you know, a kit, if you will. And in it, besides the soapstone carving stuff, it had a piece of soapstone, a square block of soapstone. And I looked at that square block. I said, what the hell is that going to be? So it sat on my desk for years. One day I was talking to a professional carver, um, sculptor, artist, and I told him this story and I said, yeah, and then I got this square block and I said to him, what do you do with a square block? He kind of looks at me for a second and he says, anything you want. The narrative of how you were supposed to create soapstone, I had taken it literally to mean that was the only way to make soapstone, or to carve. The only way to think about carving. I'd limited my narrative to that way of carving, as if that was the only way to carve. We do that in life. We find a narrative that speaks to us, and we stick with it. And we apply it everywhere, not realizing that we're confining ourselves artificially. And that's like YouTube. We have an artificial idea of what it is, an artificial idea of what it should be. And that's what I want to discourage people from doing. Don't think of it one way. There are other ways of perceiving that world. Now, I'm a huge fan of YouTube, in part because I'm a huge fan of Google and now the parent company Alphabet. I believe in the people, the CEOs behind this company. I wouldn't actually use their products if I didn't actually believe in them. And I'm a supporter of the products. I, I'm vigilant about keeping on this platform. Not that other platforms don't work. Not that other platforms may, might not be better in other ways. But I want this platform to get better. I want this service to get better. Because I am committed to making all of Alphabet's products as good as they can be because I think it's better for us. I share their vision in a lot of ways and I have done it consciously realizing I am making a conscious choice to be an advocate for their products and I encourage people to use them even though I know sometimes there are limits and I say I acknowledge those lim limits. Now you say well a lot of people may think that's a bad thing as if, well, you should be agnostic, you should be platform as I understand this is not a perfect product, that Google Alphabet is not a perfect company. But I understand that it gets better if I ask them to get better. If I demand of them the same kind of commitment I have to them, their commitment to me, it's reciprocity. It's a team effort. So I understand people being critical, and I have no problem with people being critical of Google, being critical of YouTube, and asking for change, asking 
for a better system. That's exactly what we need to do. Keep doing it. Now, my commitment is to this product. It's not that another product might not be better, and I encourage other people to create other products that will be better. That's what they should do. That makes Google, that makes YouTube better. And I'll be the first person to complain if they become vicious towards that competition. We, I have hope in the culture that they can fix these mistakes. And so I have a high expectation of them. And I will continue to have a high expectation of them until they simply aren't listening, until they're simply not doing. Then I will have to abandon ship. I will have to say, no, this isn't going to work. We need another company. This can become what we want it to become. And continue to demand it is what we need to do. Continue to hold people's feet to the fire. I think their potential is there. And I believe the heart is there. And we need to be strategic if we want this to be what we want it to be. Now, I do see it as a democratic platform. And I want to try to instill democratic principles of free speech and of liberty within this platform. And I want to help them acknowledge why this is good for them and why this is good for everyone. Continue to be strong. Continue to fight this fight is important. Now, I do like the idea of innocent until proven guilty because it puts the burden of proof on the accuser. Prove that I've been bad. Prove that I've done something wrong. Now, and this is something that's a mistake in the system because it's easier to simply take the side of the accuser because then you don't have to prove anything. You know, the burden of proof is on the accused. So then they have to prove they're innocent. Yes, it's simpler, and I agree. And it's an expedient process. We can't do that. YouTube, you can't do that. That's not what we want to do. You really, really have to look at it from the perspective of the bad players. Who are the bad players in this particular situation? Everyone should be held accountable. And everyone deserves respect. If someone accuses someone of something, of doing something wrong, we need to hold the accuser accountable as well as potentially the person they're accusing. It needs to be equally done. We need to keep them in a balance because we, the game that get, happens when you get out of disbalance is it encourages bad behavior on the part of the person playing a victim. I know for many people, um, this idea of professional victim hasn't really talk, taken hold. Um, it is a thing. It is a real thing. And it's a good strategy. And it, as a strategian, as someone who understands strategy and thinks carefully about strategy, I'm saying, is there a strategy to be played here? You know, is there some way of playing this strategy? And there is. To think strategically is to simply recognize that there is a there is a way to play this. There is a way to use this and use the system against you. That's the way social engineering works. It's like, what's going on here? How can I use normal human behavior to get them to do a specific thing I want them to do? And it is, and, and any system is susceptible to social engineering. And that's essentially what's going on here on the platform of YouTube. You can't be passive about this. You have to be actively aware and study the problem and study the individuals in play, unfortunately. Now, we can automate a part of the process, but if a human comes involved, we need to train the human that gets involved to be aware of the strategic variables that are active. Growing up, when I was riding my woolly mammoth to school, I took a soap stomine 
soapstoning, stoning class where I stone people with soapstone. Yeah, right.